Now, what's happening in Australia is unprecedented. The bushfires have killed 18 people. They've killed close to half a billion animals. They're over twice as big as the Amazon forest fires, and they're exerting extreme political pressure on Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Earlier, he was heckled in Cobargo in New South Wales. There, two people have died and many homes have been lost. The Guardian has compared its main street before and after the fires. And its residents wanted to talk to the Prime Minister. You are out, son. You are out. Not a about the people who are Mr Prime Minister? What about the people who have nowhere to live? And here he is meeting another angry resident who wants to talk about more support for the rural fire service. Sorry, good. How are you? I'm only shaking your hand if you give more funding to our RFS. So many people here have lost their homes. We need some help. We need more help. We need more help. There's the Prime Minister shaking a woman's hand and then walking away as she continued to talk about the help her community needs. He then encountered a firefighter who was equally unenthused at the idea of shaking his hand. Well, after these encounters, Scott Morrison said he wasn't surprised that people are feeling very raw. And certainly, this crisis is bringing incredible pressure on many Australians. Here are some of the most recent pictures. These are from Victoria. And you can see the scale of not just the fires, but the volume of smoke that's being generated. Many of these are so big, they're even forming their own weather events, which can then generate lightning, which then in turn sparks more fires. These pictures released by firefighters in New South Wales again show us the extreme conditions in which these men and women are working. We've also got these pictures from a small town in New South Wales called Mogo. The devastation is all but complete. And because of all of this, thousands of Australians have decided they need to leave the areas affected in part because conditions are predicted to worsen over the weekend with more high temperatures and more strong winds. Because of all of this, New South Wales has declared a week-long state of emergency. That is partly because of the calculation that the threat level is likely to increase rather than decrease. Another way of viewing the scale of this is this satellite image, which shows you the volume of smoke spreading across much of the state. Or you can look at the crisis in terms of figures. The Amazon bushfires of last year burnt through 900,000 hectares. The California wildfires of 2018 went through 800,000 hectares. In just New South Wales in Australia, more than 4 million hectares have been burnt in the last six months. That's brought devastating human costs and devastating environmental costs too. Ecologists at the University of Sydney are estimating 480 million animals have been killed by these fires. Koalas have been terribly affected. 8,000 are estimated to have died. To put that in context, that's around one-third of the koala population in New South Wales. So let's hear more from Australians who are being caught up in this story. The fireball just came through at about 80k an hour, hit the house and then we ran into the lake and now all the embers and everything were hitting us, burnt our hair a little bit and we were in there for about an hour before we got rescued. When something like that stares you in the face, it's very frightening. So I'd like to thank everybody that has done something for me. I think someone's dropped a bomb on us, basically. That's what it feels like. So here you have Cabago on the coast. Move north in the direction of Sydney and you'll come to a town called Conjola, also in New South Wales. The BBC's Shima Khalil is there. The extent of the damage that these huge fires have caused here in Lake Conjola is all around. Homes have been ravaged. The earth is scorched, still smouldering, still hot. And you can feel the smoke. Three people died in this small community alone, one of them just up the street over here. This is one of the coastal towns where tourists have been given 48 hours to evacuate. Many of them have been trying to get out. It's been very hard for them to leave because the conditions around us are still quite hazardous. Residents are still in shock at what happened to their town. Some have left when the fires hit. Others stayed to defend their homes. We could see it coming and then it was jumping from house to house. We had nearly eight houses um, on a light. You know, did we sort of cheat it? That we were survived. Yeah, it's pretty.
pretty traumatic. That's one resident of Conjola, and this image was photographed in his town. It's been featured on many front pages around the world and was taken by the photojournalist Matthew Abbott. He tweeted, My last day of the decade felt like the apocalypse. I've been covering the fires for the last six weeks, but I haven't seen anything like yesterday's fire that decimated the town of Conjola. And he's been speaking to the BBC. I came down the main street and this one house was on fire. Um, you know, there was lots of neighbours trying to put the house out, you know, trying to remove um, garbage bins that were melting and trying to protect their own uh, properties with, uh, with hoses. It's a dangerous job. Um, there are times when, you know, you're kind of wondering, you know, should I go down this road or should, should I hold back? But, you know, it's very important um, for photographers to be able to, to be there and see these things as they happen. Um, and, you know, this image is probably, you know, is testament to that. It's being seen around the world um, and it gives an idea of just just how serious this current crisis, crisis is for Australians. Well, there's Conjola on the map. Go south and you get to the coastal town of Malakuta in Victoria. People there have had to take shelter on the beach. They did so on New Year's Eve. Incredibly, this image was taken during the daytime. You may well have seen this image widely shared of an 11-year-old boy steering his family to safety in a boat there. And we know that dozens of homes have already been destroyed in this town. And it's also becoming hard to get help into the people who are there. There's only one road in Malakuta that gets you in and out, and it's cut off. That means thousands of people are trapped. And that also means the Australian Navy is starting to work on getting people out by boat. So we have the opportunity today to potentially move about 500 people out of Malakuta. The, the interesting thing about it at the moment is some people may not want to leave. They may want to stay in there with their with their four-wheel drives and their caravans until such time as they may be able to get out by road. That could be a number of weeks. That could be two to three weeks at this stage. Now, meteorologists will always tell you it's impossible to link a specific extreme weather event with climate change. They're not so reticent, though, when talking about temperatures in Australia across the last century, coming from 1910, warmer and warmer and warmer, in particular, increases in the last 25 years. And these long-term temperature increases are connected to climate change, which in turn is caused by human activity. And we know there have been record temperatures throughout these weeks when the bushfires have spread. All of which means some Australians argue the fires are a moment of reckoning. Bridget Delaney is a journalist with Guardian Australia. She says maybe these fires will be Australia's Sandy Hook Parkland moment. We urge the government to do something, and if they don't create a meaningful climate policy after this epic destructive summer, they probably never will. Now, we've seen this view widely shared, the idea that if this doesn't shift the debate, perhaps nothing will. Well, we'll have to see. But the government so far has yet to move an inch on its climate policies. And the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, might argue he doesn't need to. He says he's already acknowledged the link between reducing emissions and reducing the risks of bushfire seasons like this one. It's worth remembering, though, Mr Morrison's deputy said of arguments linking these bushfires to climate change that they were the ravings of some pure, enlightened and woke capital city greenies. And he's still the deputy prime minister. The prime minister also argues that Australia is keeping its side of the bargain on climate change. Here's more from him on this. What we will do is ensure that our policies remain sensible, that they don't move towards either extreme and stay focused on what Australians need for a vibrant and viable economy as well as a vibrant and sustainable environment. Getting the balance right is what Australia, I think, has always been able to achieve. But right now, the focus, as I said at the outset, is to fight these fires and to get people to safety. So the Prime Minister is talking about balance. Let's add a little more context to that. Australia is the world's third largest exporter of fossil fuels. Uh, you can see Russia, Saudi Arabia, one and two, Australia third, and the majority of those fossil fuel uh, exports are coal. In 2018, Australia exported $42 billion worth of coal. And, of course, fossil fuels are an enormous contributor to global warming. But, as the Prime Minister alluded to, they also create lots of jobs. Around 50,000 workers in Australia are connected to the fossil fuel industry. And we know that around 60% of Australia's electricity comes from coal-fired power stations. Indeed, last year, a new coal mine was approved in Queensland. But the way that Australians are calculating 
their emissions is also being challenged more broadly. This is all part of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. The government says it's not doing anything wrong, but the woman who created the Paris Accord, a former French government minister, has said um, that actually if the Australians are continuing to count as they do, this is just cheating. So there are extreme pressures again coming on Australia and its approach to this issue. Now, the hottest temperatures on record in Australia, unprecedented bushfires. You might think this was a guaranteed lead story in the Australian news media. It is for some. Here's the Sydney Morning Herald escaping the red zone as its headline. But here we have the Australian newspaper owned by Rupert Murdoch, known to lean to the right politically. Its main picture is about horse racing. Its main story is about a yet-to-be-confirmed proposal to restrict alcohol sales in Western Australia. And you can see the bushfires are positioned here on the left. And we saw something similar before Christmas too. On the day after Australia's highest temperatures on record, the Australian led with Asia's coal hunger to lift exports. More evidence that these fires and more broadly climate change and how they're covered in the media are profoundly political in Australia. The conclusions people draw about what's causing these current bushfires will impact on how Australians view climate change, how they view their fossil fuel industry, how they want their economy to be structured. And that's why the media, the politicians, the people are all paying close attention, not just to what's happening, but the conclusions that are drawn. Here's more on that point from Latika Burke, correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald, based here in London. Australia is well used to bushfires, but this extremity, this intensity, this degree, Australia has not seen before. And these are the worst in living memory. And so while people run around in Australia saying, hey, this is not to do with climate change, Australia's always been this country of, of droughts, of, of fires and of floods. That's true. But the climate change scientists have always said that this is what would happen. Those things would become more intense. Those things would become more extreme. And now people are dealing with this inferno on their doorsteps, they're seeing their houses raised, their homes lost, and in many instances, um, lives gone. Scott Morrison has dealt with this extremely badly, as you can see from that footage. Now, he was uh, overseas on holiday in Hawaii when these fires really did start to get quite intense uh, and there were lives lost at that point. He was forced to come back. I think he resented that and now he's trying here to say to his supporters this is climate change because the moment he accepts that this is to do with climate change he's in a very vulnerable position. And there's much more on what's happening in Australia via the BBC News app.